Hi, welcome to PSCO Kotlin Multiplatform presentation. My name is Isuru Rajpaksha and I want to showcase the PSCO Kotlin Multiplatform. Well, what is PSCO Kotlin Multiplatform, you ask? Well, it, as of right now, it's a technology preview. It's a project that targets Android, iOS, Windows, Mac, and Linux. They all share the same business rules and supporting infrastructure and utilize native UI on their own platform. For this demonstration, I will be showcasing the login feature where you use a username and a password to log in to the PSCO middleware. All three clients share the networking, caching and business logic internally. Here I'm just going to use a wrong password for now, but this is just to show that we are indeed getting a response back from a web service. I'll do the same on the Android client here. And I'll also do the same on the desktop client. The UI you're seeing here is all native with Android client using their own native UI, Jetpack Compose to be exact, and the iOS client using its own native UI as well, built with Swift UI. To demonstrate that they do indeed share business logic, what I'm going to do is I'm open. I'm going to open up Android Studio, and change a bit of validation logic here. I'm going to remove the bit that validates the password, so the the sign in button is enabled even when the password is empty. I'm going to open up the desktop client. And also the iOS client as well as the Android client. I can do all that within Android Studio. I've sped up the build times here, but it's well under one minute. As you can see, the change of business logic should be in effect. If I just put in the username, you should be able to see the sign-in button is now enabled. And this effect was on all three platforms. And that is the Kotlin multi-platform with shared business logic. And it's not just the business logic we do end up sharing. We also share the same networking logic and as well as the caching of the, the models that we do get end up from the web service. With this, we, we can share a lot of code and business logic in between the clients and only focus on the UI on the front ends with their native platforms. I'm going to be breaking down the pace of this presentation with five questions. What is Kotlin Multiplatform? Where does the Kotlin Multiplatform fall in with the rest of the cross-platform toolkits? How does Kotlin Multiplatform work and why bother with Kotlin Multiplatform? And when is Kotlin Multiplatform production ready? So let's start with what is Kotlin Multiplatform. So when I say Kotlin Multiplatform, I don't really mean as it has an extension of what Kotlin is. Rather, the Kotlin is multiplatform. When you write your Kotlin code, it gets translated into what you call an intermediate representation, IR for short. Depending on which platform Kotlin is targeted, this IR gets compiled further into their native representation. On the JVM, this gets compiled into Java bytecode. On iOS, this gets compiled into the Objective-C. On the browser, com Kotlin is compiled into raw JavaScript, and in the future, it will be supporting WebAssembly as well. And this is achieved with a powerful Kotlin multi-platform Gradle plugin. Alright, so let's talk about where does the Kotlin multi-platform sort of falls in with the rest of the cross-platform suits. Well, this is a big thing I want to get out of the way. The, the, the fact that the multi-platform isn't the same thing as a cross-platform. 
uh, the terminology with cross-platform comes with a lot of historical baggage. If you look at throughout the last two decades, there's been plenty of attempts of sharing code between the platforms. And we call these the cross-platform development toolkits, um, everything from PhoneGap, Ionic, Adobe Air, Flutter, Xamarin, uh, React Native, uh, to name a few. On the other side of the aisle, we have native development toolkits such as Android SDK and the iOS SDK. We can think of these two uh, as two different planets that has different levels of gravitational influence of first party and the third party. On the short orbit, you have the first party. This is where the makers of the operating system itself expose their own development toolkits that they use to build the system UI to external third party developers so that the apps are really part of the system itself. On the outer orbit, you have third party toolkits in order to able to share the code between the platforms we had to intentionally to gravitate away from the operating system out of necessity. As a result, what you get is layers of layers of abstraction on top of abstraction just to get, just to share a bit of code. To a level, I might say these cross-platform toolkits really went too far. I'm a believer in this quote. I believe that duplication is always better than the wrong abstraction. I personally think cross-platform development toolkits took a step too far in terms of abstraction. Most of these cross-platform SDKs are attempting to, you know, share it all. They share infrastructure, they share business logic, and also UI. This results in what you call a take-all-or-nothing approach. That is, if you want to cross, if you want to go cross-platform, you have to throw away your existing native code. Colony multi-platform embraces the fact that it won't be, it won't ever be as good as the first-party toolkits in creating fully native UI experiences. It is an attempt at abstracting away the complexities of UI, and the native SDKs are so good at over the years. Instead, it attempts to share what matters the most, which is the business rules and the surrounding infrastructure. Sharing just business rules and infrastructure isn't a new thing either. There's been a, f uh, there's a famous case study with Dropbox they shared in 2019. The Dropbox team attempted to share C++ infrastructure and business logic. Um, it's all outlined in this article, but I want to sort of brief up that article for this presentation. In that article, they mentioned about four, four different key overheads. And the, the key overhead is they wanted, with the C++ shared code, they had a lot of overhead addressing differences between the platforms. And they had, in order to address the differences, they had to work on a bunch of custom libraries and frameworks. And on top of that, they had a custom development environment and a lot of training and hiring and also work to just to retain the developers. Kotlin multi-platform attempts to solve this issue of overhead by addressing the differences between the platforms by having to design a language from ground up by keeping differences of the platforms in mind. Kotlin has, as a language, has a unified memory management model on top of a concurrency model that addresses some of these differences. To address the problem of custom frameworks, Kotlin itself has a huge open source community of people who worked on frameworks and libraries targeting multiple platforms. To address the problem of custom development environment, Kotlin itself try, goes, its, goes out of its way to interrupt with existing IDEs and toolkits and tool chains. And good thing about Kotlin itself is that since you still need a lot of native development skills, you can transfer the existing skills of native platform developers to the Kotlin multi-platform and also retain the existing developers from your own platforms. Let's get to how Kotlin multi-platform itself works. 
In order to answer this question, I think I need to give some context as to what an app typically would do these days. I'll start with Android because that's where I'm coming from. Typically, you would have some sort of a middleware service that delivers a lot of data. The app consumes the, this data, unpacks this data from its models, and this is where most of the hard work is really happening. Then this data is being brought into the table where you apply the business rules on. You apply the business rules on the data to transform that data into some sort of a presentation model or a view model. This is where I would say the most crucial work happens. That is to say, if you make a mistake here, you are making a mistake in the business logic itself. And then this data or this presentation data is taken in to actually create the views themselves. And this is where the Android SDK comes in. Actually, this is where the most fun bit of Android actually happens, creating your own custom native UI. And that's the Android app as a whole, in a nutshell. Of course, there's a lot of more things happening. It's not just API data we're consuming. Sometimes we're consuming sensors. Sometimes we're consuming some sort of other service that gives us data. But this is just a little abstraction of that. Let's take a look over the fence and let's see how the iOS counterpart sort of works. Here we have the same middle middleware backend service that delivers data. The app consumes and unpacks the data models. And this is where the most of the hard works occurs as well. The data is then taken into the table where we apply the business rules on the data models to transform them, them into a presentation model. And this is yet again where the crucial work happens again. And then we utilize the iOS SDK to present those view models of the presentation data. And this is where the most of the fun occurs on the iOS side as well. So if you would take a step back, you would see that both of these apps are essentially doing the same thing, really. They're only separated by the platform they happen to run on. With Kotlin multi-platform, you would have shared infrastructure. What this really means is that with the shared Kotlin layer, it'll end up doing the most of the hard work of consuming and unpacking data for you. It also does the crucial work of applying the business rules only once. And given that this is centralized and written only once, you're going to end up having less bugs overall. The data is transformed into view models and then Kotlin hands these presentation models right back to the native platform, where the native platforms can do what they enjoy the most, that is creating the native UI of their choosing. And this is what Kotlin Multiplatform sort of achieves. Let's talk about what you end up writing and how it ends up running on a given platform with Kotlin Multiplatform. I brought in a couple more examples from Flutter and React Native. Uh, those are uh, cross-platform development toolkits just for comparison. On Kotlin Multiplatform, you end up writing your Kotlin business logic once and you have to write your own UI with Compose or Swift UI. Uh, Compose and SwiftUI are the, just the two examples I ended up using. Kotlin Multiplatform itself doesn't really force you to write UI in any of toolkits really. It it's, leaves the option of toolkits for you to decide. With Flutter, you write your business logic in Dart and you're forced to use Flutter widgets. With React Native, you, you're using JavaScript or any J JavaScript variant like TypeScript to write your business logic and you're forced to use React components. In terms of how it runs, your Kotlin native business logic get compiled into on the Android side into a jar and on the iOS side it'll be a, a simple Objective-C framework. And they both will be running on, on the Android side, it'll be running native Android UI and on the iOS, it'll be running native iOS UI. With Flutter, you 
or the actual business logic you write in Dart get run on top of the native development kit on the Android side and the actual vi uh, the Flutter widgets you write are emulated on, on, on top of the Skia graphics engine. On the iOS side, it'll get run on the LLVM with the same Skia graphics engine emulating all the widgets. With React Native, it is true that you're getting Android native UI on the Android and native iOS UI on iOS. However, that comes at the cost of lots of C++ bridging just to emulate JavaScript on a native device. So you still have to emulate on native. If you compare all three toolkits, there's no real contest here. It's quite obvious that Kotlin Multiplatform is the most native out of the three here. All right, let's talk about why should you bother with Kotlin Multiplatform. Typically, when you write a platform-specific app, you end up writing about 100% of the code. Multiply by the number of targets, you would end up with 300%. Not only this means you end up writing three times as many code, you also ended up writing three times as many bugs. With Kotlin Multiplatform, you share around 80% of your code base with each of the platforms. But you still need to write about 20 around 20% of platform specific UI code, so which yields around 140% altogether. Which means you only end up around 1.4% 1, 1 as many bugs, theoretically, anyways. The business logic and the UI is just the tip of this Kotlin multi-platform. I won't get into too much right now, but Kotlin multi-platform itself enables um, a rich ecosystem of multi-platform libraries. And this is what PS Core multi-platform project, or this is where the PS Core multi-platform project currently is. When is PS Core multi-platform really ready? Well, as of right now, I'm targeting these four platforms. You can check out the repo and see how the code itself works. There's pipelines and app center links right there. In terms of stability, I'd say PS Core Android is super stable. With all the tool chains, it requires it's as stable as you can get. The PS Core desktop client, uh, I would say beta, mainly because Compose for desktop is beta itself. And PS Core iOS, I would say it's pretty alpha, mainly because the PS Core multi-platform plugin itself is on alpha. PS Core web client is unfortunately super experimental. So much so I couldn't even get it to work. <laughs> and yeah, that's where the PS Core multi-platform clients and their stabilities are. I sort of borrowed the definitions of component stability from the Kotlin itself. You can read more about that on the link there. And thanks for watching. And you can learn more about PS Core multi-platform Android client and also the PS Core multi-platform native client on these presentations linked here.